Hi, and welcome to Zooming the Pandemic, the comics edition. This is our special for VanCAF, the Vancouver Comic Arts Festival. And this time around, I'm going to be talking with Mary Fleener. Mary is a talented and really outside the box artist whose style is often referred to as cubismo. And you'll see why when you see samples of her art during our talk here. Great stories as usual with Mary. Stay tuned. Enjoy. Let's say first of all, Mary, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is so cool. I use this as an excuse to kind of connect with people I haven't seen in forever because when I left comics, I just kind of, outside of Trina, I kind of lost track of everybody. So this has been great. Thank you so much for doing this. So how are you doing, my dear? Well, so far so good. Uh, you know, with, with the pandemic, we, uh, here in Encinitas, we're a little off uh, the spike, but uh, I worry, I worry. Uh, three weeks ago, we had a paddle out for George Floyd 4,000 idiots went down to the beach and they went out in the water. You don't wear a mask when you're out in the water. And when you're a surfer, which I was avidly, you're constantly spitting up water and stuff's coming out of your nose and, you know, you, you, you yeah. salt water <laughs> all the time. So um, my husband and I, you know, he's been retired four years and I've got this solitary cartoonist lifestyle. So our Life hasn't changed much. I'm going to get Scotty from Star Trek <laughs> to put a line of marching ants around my whole property with my yard and all my plants and lift up and go back to Vancouver. I would do it yesterday. Yeah. I never knew, I never got to New Westminster too much because I was just a kid and we were over in West Van. And usually what I would do is take the bus to Ambleside and then walk across the bridge and then go to Stanley Park or go to the beaches there and uh, you know, I was 13 or 14. So you were know. you in the comics when you were living up here? Not at all. No. Except for Len Morris, the guy that did the uh, cartoons for the Vancouver Sun. Ah, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Never him? Yes, I've seen his work when I'm doing archival research in the Sun, yeah. I love the way he drew, drew little kids. They look like little demons. They're just perfect. So the only comics I was into were the comics in the newspaper. Yeah. But I started that when I was in the second grade because in LA we had the Herald Examiner and the LA Times. And so I would spend hours in my bedroom looking at the styles of the drawings and just wondering if it, did a human being really draw this? Exactly. Well, there were no machines that could do it, so it had to be a human being. But, you know, things like Dick Tracy was like so creepy and weird. I loved it. And I loved Little Abner and the Little King. And of course, uh, I really liked the really corny ones like Mary Worth because nothing ever happened, but it was so surreal. It was like a bad haiku poem. <laughs> and then Apartment 3G, I love that one too. Yeah, Mary Wilsh and I were talking about Apartment 3G, how it was yeah. speaking to, to girls growing uh, understanding that they could um, go out to the city and have this independent life and have this glamorous life. We all wanted to live like the girls in apartment 3g i know i did yeah 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 the, now that you mentioned it it was really a, a, a uh, empowering thing to read because they yeah. were you know and i was into nancy drew too i read all the nancy drew books i just thought it was great that she you know her dad was really smart but she didn't need anybody she just did what she wanted and solved all these mysteries and her boyfriend ken sound like a real schlub but uh the books are great they taught me how to read yeah. So that's why I was in Canada. But, it, you know, even though I didn't have access to comic books, um, well, there's two reasons. I didn't, my parents didn't give me any money. I didn't have an allowance. And my mom hated the romance comics because they always had the Fredericks of Hollywood ads in the back. <laughs> and she thought they were too sexy for me to look at. And I had already started drawing ladies with big boobs and stuff because I grew up in the era of Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe and Bridget Bardot. And my mom had a rack. And she like, you know, here's a third grader drawing these ladies with, you know, big boobs. And she's like, no, don't do that. That's, that's bad. I'm like, what's bad about it? You know, I mean, and she was an artist too. And I'd seen plenty of ancient art where everybody's naked, which used to crack me up. You know, all these religious paintings and all the little cherubs are naked. And you're like, going, mm. 
So um, no, I didn't really get into comic books until the uh, mid seventies when all my friends who were uh, rock and roll people were had copies of the Hulk and, you know, cause it, it seems so, you know, low brow to have comic books. So I thought, yeah, I'm gonna start reading that. So I started reading the Hulk and the Howard the Duck. That's what really got me going. And Zap Comics before that, of course, you know. So Zap Comics, Undergrounds, what got yeah. you into all that kind of stuff? And, and, you know, you did a lot of work in that sort of vein for quite a few years. Where, how did you get into, how did you end up getting into comics? If you weren't in it when you were a teen, young, a preteen and a teenager, what got you in? What was your first job? I think one of your one of your first jobs, really, was um, Hoodoo with uh, with Ray Zone. Well, actually, my first paying job was the Couch Potato newsletter that Bob Armstrong put out with his wife, and I did a little strip called the Techno Cats, and I was just starting my Cubismo style, and I got paid a whole ten bucks. Ooh. That was my first paying job. <laughs> with him and then uh, I was doing a little thing you know mini comics that was really sort of what got me into the whole scene were mini comics more than anything else hoodoo was 1988 and I had done um, I met I met Ray Zone through the art scene up in LA La Luz de Jesus and I kept running into him he had a little group called the art boys mm -hmm. and they like to go down the river and spray graffiti all over the river uh -huh. And that was, you know, Carol A. and Robert Williams and Jern Jan Dean and the George DiCaprio and, um, oh, who else would have done that? And Piz and Coop, I think, maybe at that time. So Ray had a series called Illa Stories, which were like mini comics. They were eight pagers, but he printed them on Xerox paper and very cheaply. So I did this one called, um, oh, I don't even remember, but it was, it was voodoo based because I was always interested in voodoo stuff because of blues music and jazz. So he printed up my little book and somebody told me about Zora Neale Hurston. And so I started reading her stuff and then two other women and myself, and we were all named Mary. We put out a, a magazine called Demo. And one of the girls worked in a print shop. So she was able to steal all the time and all the paper that she wanted. And that was the first publication that I was involved in uh, publishing with these two other gals. So I did a Zora Neale Hurston story for that. And that's when Ray goes, why don't you do a whole book about her? And I go, well, what about copyright? Well, it was kind of up in the air because Bob Callahan, who had Turtle Island Press, had published her, a lot of her books like um, uh, Tell My Horse and Dust Tracks on the Road. He, I think he published all of them. And I don't know if you knew Bob, but he was this crazy Irish guy. Ray goes, oh, no, it's public domain. I know about publishing. I go, okay, you're the publisher. <laughs> so I, that was, yeah, my first comic book was Hoodoo, officially. And I would love, you used to ask about dream projects. I would love to do another one. But unfortunately, a few, a few years later, her brother, John Hurston, renewed the copyright. Uh. The family retained the rights. And he has a daughter, and I forget her name, but she's very protective of Zora's uh, property she's racist she only wants black people drawing Zora's work and she's um uh, it's odd because her Zora Neil Hurston's family thought of her as an embarrassment they ignored her they didn't help her she worked as a maid her whole life and I was wondering if there was like a special attraction to the idea of doing biographies because you could even sort of say the drawing power is uh, autobiographic well it's autobiographical and yeah. and and it's a collection of autobiographical is is there something in biographical stories that draws you because it's a very different subject matter from what you usually see in comics yeah i'm and you know i'm really fortunate that i got into comics like right now because before it was the gag and the build up and the payoff the gag or the superheroes, or the funny animals, and everything is supposed to be funny, ha ha, and now everything's gotten a more literary uh, appreciation. Yeah. And, and uh, there's, I love reading biographies. That's my favorite thing to read at the library. Because it's just, and I like fiction too, don't get me wrong, but biographies, biographies are 
or need, especially when you read about musicians like Miles Davis and Dinah Washington and all those people, their lives that they led are just, you know, incredible. And so that appealed to me. As far as autobiographical, I kind of got inspired by Zora Neale Hurston. After I read Dust, Dust Tracks on the Road, I thought, gosh, you know, she's not really using seven syllable words. She's just kind of writing like she's talking to you on the telephone. And, and maybe there's a little Barney thrown in there and a little embellishment, but I kind of, it, it kind of clicked for me after I read her stuff. And I, I've always been a freak magnet. I've always met really weird people. I, I, I always seem to get in these odd situations, but I escape unscathed. And um, I, I've always liked telling stories at parties about, you know, like just driving to a, a party anything could happen and and there's a way to tell it where it, it might be sad but you can kind of turn it into the theater of the absurd mm -hmm. so that's kind of always been my angle when i tell write stories about myself even the one in drawing power even though it was uh, uh, oh my god that was the most difficult thing i've ever had to draw it was horrible um it made me cry um uh, i want to i want to find these guys and i want to kill them but i can't do that but when you go through that kind of thing where you just bear open your soul, it's prepared me for my latest book that I'm working about on called The Happy Hour. So all these little things are kind of little steps and like a pebble in a pond, the little rays float out there and you kind of build upon all that. I really enjoyed doing the, the story of Diana, Diana, Diane De Prima for the Beatnik book, uh, the Beats a memoir or graphic memoir that, uh, let's see, uh, Harvey Picard wrote the text and Paul Buell published it. I, yeah, he did. And of course, by that time, Harvey was really sick and he gave me a script that was eight sentences. <laughs> like, I thanks, Harvey. So I thought, well, I better learn about this woman because she's still alive. She's into astrology. She's into witchcraft and voodoo and all, and all this stuff. So I, I better do her proper. Well, she, she certainly lived a life. I mean, and, and was, successful and tenacious and um so i i read about i'd say easily 50 books about the beats and i educated myself i could teach a class about them now and because i wanted to you know tell her story and i was so happy when i finally mailed her the story she sent me a copy of her book loba and a really nice note telling me i got it she really appreciated it and i'm like going because <laughs> she's she's got quite a quite a reputation as a diva but we both have Sagittarius rising, so we know how to have a good time. Tell me a little bit about the the new project you're working on. Oh, okay. Um, I cover a bit of this time of my life in Life of the Party, and I was a semi-professional musician from 74 to 77, well, 75, 77, at a gay bar out in Orange County on Garden Grove Boulevard. And I played there every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, nine to nine thirty till one thirty in the morning. Forty-five bucks a night, which was pretty good dough back then. And I had I had a part-time job too. And um, it was crazy. I was like Liza Minnelli in the movie Cabaret, <laughs> because when you think about that time, it was pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-AIDS, pre. -AIDS, pre um, it was a crazy you know, time then to be out in the bars, and I, mean, I was reviewing bands around then, so I know it was crazy. Uh, cigarette smoke, oh. drugs, amyl nitrate, anything you wanted to do. You know, I used to call myself a trisexual. I'd try anything once, and so did everybody else. And so the book I'm doing, I'm, I'm naming it after the bar. It's called The Happy Hour because that was the name of the bar. And the woman that ran it had almost ran it. They had a almost had 40 years and unfortunately she died in 2012 two weeks before they were going to have the big party from lung problems from all that smoke and a lot of musicians i know that have played through that era in the 80s have emphysema now oh. and it was it was it was hard on it was a hard lifestyle so the book starts with me being in college as an art major and i'm unhappy i can't make friends i can't find a boyfriend um, my catch my teacher having sex with his TA and I really looked up to this guy and so one day I just said screw this and I just walked out the door and um, 
decided to throw away all my art supplies and I declared myself a musician. I got a job in a music store, I bought a bass, and that's what I did for the next four years. And it almost killed me. And uh, the reason I dropped out of school is I wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to be an underground cartoonist and being a cartoonist was like, you were laughed at. Um, I wish I'd known Roberta Gregory because she was right across the courtyard in the illustration department. So was Phil Yeh. Yeah. So if I'd known them and I got a boyfriend, I might have graduated, but I was so lonely and, and frustrated and my art skills were declining because of exposure to all these chemicals acetate, paint thinner, oil-based paints, nitric acid. I mean, and of course we're all smoking cigarettes while we're doing all this. Mm -hmm. So anyway, after about four years, I was sitting around and um, I was at my girlfriend's house and I was drawing a telephone and all of a sudden I go, shit, I can draw again. All right, I'm becoming a cartoonist. We're gonna do this my way. And my muse said, good girl. <laughs> So that's kind of sort of a full circle story, coming of age. It's not, yeah, I'm not writing war, war and Peace, but I do want to talk about what it was like to um, change your direction in your life and try to find your path. And then you finally find your path after you go through, walk through battery acid for four years. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to be, it's probably going to be 200 pages or longer because in my sketchbook, what I thought was page three, I'm not now on page 24. Uh. <laughs> I'm trying to stretch out and I'm trying to really, really get into it. So the first chapter has three sex scenes alone. <laughs> so this is not something I'm gonna be showing my mom. No. But uh, after I did Billy the Bee, I talked to Gary Groth about doing a trilogy about animals and he goes, would you please do an autobiographical book because you know, I know you've got another one in you and stuff that I'm seeing right now, frankly, is boring. And I go, I agree. <laughs> what has been your experience around censorship in comics? Oh boy. Uh, uh, well, um, I've never been censored. Okay, well, okay, what, okay. In the illustration world, I was censored one time because I was supposed to draw James Brown and he appeared on the Wheel of Fortune. And so what I did was I just lifted his face from an illustrated song lyric I did for Polygram Records for the James Brown story where I illustrated, I got you, I feel good. Yeah. And James Brown, he's got a big smile, big teeth, you know, he's James Brown. So I, I just almost traced what I had drawn before and the people at Entertainment Weekly wouldn't print it because they said it was racist. Oh. And I go, well, what, do you, what am I supposed to do? Put white makeup on his face? I mean, get out of here. You know, it's James Brown. You know, he's, a, he's black and he's proud. So that was that one time. Never in comics, but uh, 20 years ago, I had a P.O. box in Encinitas, and I was getting crazy mail from my fans. They would paste pictures of naked women on the envelope or put Satan rules, anything to get my attention. And somebody who was a censor at the post office started opening my mail. Oh. And all the stuff in Europe was opened. And I was working for Hustler at the time, but they always put LFP productions on there, you know, on the envelope. Because, you know, we put Hustler on there, you know, you're going to raise questions. And, um, and, but I want to stay on Hustler. Hustler was interesting because they had to have two articles per issue. And I got very political assignments from them. One was, why do black juries let off black criminals? I'm going, uh, thanks, guys. And then another one, sex education isn't being taught in the South. Prediction in 25 years, there's going to be AIDS and all sorts of STDs and, and pregnancies through the roof. That happened. Another article was how the CIA brainwashes people to make assassins. So it was heavy-duty stuff. Yeah. So anyway, when I figured out my mail was being open, I... Um, closed my P.O. box, and two weeks later, in my home address, I got child porno sent to me, and it was a sting operation. So fortunately, a guy named, uh, oh, I forget his name, some, Mr. Joseph, something Joseph, he worked for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, and he helped me. He said, you've got to get rid of all this stuff in your house that you think sketchy, surrender the document to the post office, act like the outraged citizen, otherwise, the feds might come to your house and I'm going, oh, so um, I did that. 
And I got in a huge fight with one of the guys at the post office. And I told him, you guys are trampling all over my civil rights. And it was just sort of like tough luck. And then what they did, they're supposed to forward your mail for the next year. And they wouldn't do it. So I had people that I knew, like Wayno and, and Ellen Forty, send me stuff, and it got sent back to them. So I've seen what happens when you when you butt up against the the uh, the man, and it's frightening. Yeah. And the same thing happened to Joyce Farmer, Fahrenheit four five one, up in Laguna Beach, got busted for selling tits and clits. And when the when the cops came there, they didn't have any copies left. But that didn't matter. They made everybody's life a living hell. And Joyce and Lynn Chinley were worried that the, the guys in the white cars were going to come up and knock on, you know, knock down their door. And so Joyce and I have this in common. And I tell you, it changes you. I mean, it really does change you. So um, uh, anyway, back to politics. I've always been political. Even when I was a kid, I worked for Head Start when I was in high school and um, was involved in um, the, sub the Suburban League, which was, uh, we would meet with, Black Panther guys up in Englewood and have meetings and just talk, 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 talk. And, and they all thought I was just this little entitled white girl, but I wanted to make a difference. You know, I marched for Angela Davis. I did a lot of that, you know, the Vietnam protests and that kind of thing. Then I got involved with local politics about 1988 and um, went to a lot of meetings and uh, started doing my political cartoons for a local paper and finally decided three years ago that I'd given enough to this town and it was time to do for me, me, me. And once again, my muse patted me on the head and said, good girl. And so after I made that decision, my whole comic thing just changed for the better. And I got super creative and did my book and, you know, it just, everything just fell into place. Like, you know, I mean, my book didn't, you know, fly off the shelves, but I, I damn it, I drew 164 pages and, was focused. When I worked for our local paper. I was, I was committed to what I was doing, but I didn't know how to do single panel political cartoons. And I didn't think it was fair to ask for money. I did 44 weeks for free. Wow. I, felt, I, I didn't, I had, I wanted to learn how to do this and I, 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 and I enjoyed it. I call myself a socialist. I don't think it's a dirty word. And I, and I've asked people to tell me what's the definition definition of socialism you tell me and they can't because they weren't taught it in school now up in canada we were taught that nationalism was like really dangerous so yeah. i'm really lucky that i got that education up there because they had a, a a view of politics which is much healthier than what we have down here we're, I, we're still getting over the damn civil war for god's sake of, of all people uh burn hogarth <laughs> i met him at a misfit lit panel um in LA that Fanographics did and he was looking at my stuff and he goes you should be doing paintings of these drawings and he wrote me a letter he goes make paintings out of your drawings and make the art world tremble with envy <laughs> if you can imagine talking like that and I thought yeah I, I should do that so I did a painting of the back cover of Hoodoo took it to the comic convention in 87 right the year before they moved and some crazy guy with a gold tooth bought it, and he was a tattoo artist. And um, three years later, I got a video in the mail of this guy, and he had tattooed that painting on the entire back of this guy. Wow. Um, so that was like, whoa. So that kind of gave me a shot in the arm. And so I started doing big paintings, like 36 by 48, and discovering, you know, day glow paints and using glitter and utilizing my style and so I would enter the, the show at La Luz, the uh, group show every year. I was in that for 25 years straight and Billy was so nice. Anything I would give him, I, I, if I decided to use ceramic faces, he'd go, yeah, I'll, I'll hang those. I didn't sell very much, but he was very supportive. And then I got into black velvet painting. Uh, I can't remember quite how, but for a while there in the late 90s, there was kind of a little buzz and there were shows at the Patricia Korea Gallery at Track 16 and shows at La Luz and East LA at the Self-Help Gallery. And I was in a couple shows down in Tijuana. And the last one was really neat because they had men who were like in their 90s who'd grown up on the streets of TJ painting bullfights. And, and all they had was one tube of green paint. So everything they painted was green. 
and, but it was neat talking to those guys and finding out what the different kind of velvets and, and, and you know, the techniques everybody used. That was, that was really, really cool. And, uh, and, oh, I don't know. I, 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 I once in a while I like to do arts and crafts. I made a bunch of black velvet voodoo dolls and painted little, you know, sewed little, things on and embroidered it. I took them to the Comic Con one year and everybody walked by my table and they went, oh, I'm not messing with that. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I like to try different things, but the um, thing with ceramics, you, it's womb to tomb. When you start a clay piece, you just can't leave it laying around after it dries. Right. And you have to do two firings and you just can't leave a bisque firing around for more than a couple months because the dust will get on there and the glaze won't stick and then you're screwed. Right. So um, after I get the happy hour done in a couple of years, uh, I plan to get back on the wheel, get back to it. So when you're doing a, a, pro a comic book project like you're working on right now, you don't take a break to go off and do some other art form like like a lot, like I do silversmithing. So sometimes when the writing gets too intense, I'll just take a week to go off and do bang something out on a piece of metal to kind of get my frustrations out before I go back to, you know, the mental stuff of writing. Like, do you go back and forth or do you tend to stick with one thing while you're working on it? I used to go back and forth and that's why I didn't do a book until two years ago. <laughs> so uh, with Billy, I worked on it every single day and focused strictly on that, and that seemed to work for me. Yeah. So I'm taking that same approach with this new book, but I also am a, I'm a big gardener. I, I, in fact, I grow all my food for the summer. Yeah, that looked. Your garden looked fabulous, though. What you showed me. Well, this year we had a little extra money, and I was able to get really good fertilizer. And I like to joke: most women spend money on clothes and makeup. I buy fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, I do that at the beginning of the day, and then usually about one or two, I try to get in three good hours, and or maybe four, and I just do that every day. And if I only get one panel done one day, that's fine. If I just get the lettering done, that's okay, because if you do a little bit every day, you'll get it done. I had a group of friends in college, and we were like, you know, the, the acid babies. <laughs> And we would, you know, carry on and, and go to all the concerts. And there was two guys that had bands. And so we formed this group of a clique, you might say. But we were all the, you know, the hippies. And one guy, his name was Brent Scrivener. And he and I just got along like this. And when I met him, he had a girlfriend. But in the summer of 71, he came out of the closet. So did about 10 other guys I knew. And, uh, but he was so wonderful and he was so creative in high school he built a robot he built a robot in a cage and when you put you flip the switch it would move its hands and its head would go like this he even has it signed by ray bradbury and it was on display at north high in torrance and he knew my husband and my husband was the paper boy for his family huh. so they went way back so i didn't meet brett until about 1960 1970 and um we just we just became tight and um, he got into making props for uh, movies and uh, like the ray guns that they use in Battle Beyond the Stars and the Predator and that, that meter thing and the Ghostbusters and him and his partner were working for modern props and they were really, and he designed the Devo hat, the red flower pot hat, um, wow. which I, I could grab it, but I won't. And, <laughs> and the, the Freedom from Choice wig. And he was, you know, he was just on his way. And I'll never forget the day I got the call where he told me I've been diagnosed with AIDS. And I thought, I, I felt, I felt like part of me had died. And my friend was the kind of guy that just said, okay, I've got it. I give up. I'm going to die. And so did a lot of other friends of mine. They, uh, it was a death sentence. And so when he died, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, he, he had no choice. When he, he passed, um, the idea, I, uh, we had a family meeting with him, all of, all of his friends, his mom and dad, of what we could do. And someone brought up the name, the names project. And I knew nothing about it. And then when they told me what it was about, I immediately said, I'm doing it. Nobody else in this room can do it. I have to do this because I know art. I know how to work with fabric. I know what kind of paints to use. And I knew Brett better than any of you guys. So that's why 
uh, I did the Art Deco design because he really got me into Art Deco. We would go every Wednesday to the Rose, let's see, what was it, the Rose, Rosecrans Theater? No, what was it called? It was in Gardena. Well, back when you could get really good stuff at the at these uh, swap meets, and we would go faithfully. And so he was really into Art Deco, and so was I. But he taught me he taught me how to get the eye, you know, where you're across the aisleway and you can look at a table and go, oh. Uh, I'll buy that. And everybody goes, hey, how'd you see that? <laughs> so I had, uh, I had just happened to have six yards of denim laying around. And of course, as you know, the, the guys in, who lived in the bars at that time, the clone look was you wore denim and you wore a plaid shirt. That was the uniform. And it took me about three months because in some of the areas of the fabric, I had to paint over like three times to get the, 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 the color I wanted. It's like in black velvet painting, if you use acrylic on black velvet, all that color will go through the fuzz and get on the other side and in the morning, there won't be anything there. That's why I use oil paints. But anyway, I used acrylic and then some uh, shop here, I wanted to get pictures of him on the quilt. So I took a photograph and they put, uh, they ran it through a printer or something and they put toner on some cotton for me and they did it for free when I told them what I was doing this for, which was really wonderful. And so when I got it done, we had it ready for his memorial service um, up in Torrance. But his family and friends, they wanted to add all, this, all the sequins and everything to make it, you know, more blingy. And, and all of his friends thought it was, well, yeah, in fact, a couple of these guys go, that looks too gay. And I'm going, no, it doesn't. It looks fabulous. What happened to your fabulous thing? You know, this is, this is you no, know, Brent would have loved it. So it made his parents so happy. Let's end with talking about, I mean, I, I know we kind of touched on the whole idea of a dream project. Um, is, is there anybody that you, as a writer, you know, like a writer that you would like to team up with or a project that you would write that you would like to have somebody draw? Is there anything that comes to your mind? People are always sending me scripts and they're, 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 you know, fantasy or sci-fi. I mean, I mean, if I got something really good that was sort of, you know, we had something to do with maybe if somebody wrote something about a biography of a musician, I might consider that. But there's never any money. And writers don't understand that they can knock out something in one one hundredth of the time that it takes to draw. And I, it takes me a long time to draw. And now I'm doing this cross hatching. That takes forever, but it looks so good. And I, I mean, like I said, I, I mean, if I could legally uh illustrate song lyrics that would be fun i loved working for the grateful dead comics but that was work for hire because those are their lyrics so i understand that but if i could do another something like that because that was i don't think the comics sold really well but grateful dead fans are so rabid they'll, they'll buy anything um like i said if, if i was friends with somebody new keith richards and maybe if he you know asked me to illustrate life i might I might consider it if the price was right but for the most part i'm kind of a lone wolf yeah i well, i really like the uh the james brown uh piece that you did that you sent me i mean are there other song lyrics you think would be fun to do oh god there's so many can you i mean my god uh one one that i've always wanted to do is long black veil oh yeah. that would be so great you know it might be public domain i mean I mean, that's what Dave Alvin did. He did put out a CD called Public Domain. He won a Grammy for it. So yeah, that might be an idea, getting public domain songs. Uh, yeah, the Dave talk. Brown thing was funny. Um, Robert Newman, was he at the Village Voice? Yeah, I think he was. And they were doing every week somebody illustrating music lyrics. So they used a whole different kind of artists. And he asked me to do James Brown. And I go, oh, no, James Brown. You don't mess with James Brown's company. They are... They don't take kindly to people, you know, ripping off James Brown. Well, it just so happened he was in prison at that time. <laughs> he got busted for PCP or something. And Robert goes, oh, no, just go ahead and do it. Just go ahead and do it. I'm going, yeah, are you going to pay me? And he goes, yeah, we'll pay you. And I go, they'll never let you print it. So I guess he talked to somebody at the Village Voice, and they got a hold of some guy, and apparently they – took somebody from James Brown's group out to dinner or a strip bar. Who knows? They, they talked him into it. And they, frankly, needed some good PR at the time because he, he was like, you know, PCP? I mean, come on. 
So they ran it, which was really surprising. And then I got a call from Paul Graham Records and they said they were doing the box set of James Brown and could they please reprint this? And I said, you bet you can. So that was once again another little thing that led to another little thing. Yeah. But I really like that because it's being a musician myself to try to get the, the rhythm and the tempo of the lyrics. You can't just put, you know, um, like, like the lyrics at the top of the page and then illustrate it like an illustration job. No, 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 no. You have to play with the, with the, with the font and, and get into it. So when somebody's, you know, you know, I when he's going, I feel good. Ow. Well, I can't just put a cartoon bu bubble. It goes, ow. No, you can, you can go, ow, <laughs> like that. So it was like, helping me redefine the comic uh, cliche and, and try something new. And so that's what I really like about that. Maybe your dream job would be if the Rolling Stones came to you and said, hey, we like what you did with James Brown. Can you do five of our songs? We're going to put them on the next album sort of thing. Oh, I wow. think about that. The Girl with the Faraway Eyes. That would be a great one. Yeah. And uh, Black Brown Sugar. That would be a good story. You get in trouble for that. Yeah, uh, so there you go. Dream jobs. You never know. Well, I'm a huge Stones fan, so it would be, it would, I, I was more, I, I really wasn't a Grateful Dead fan when I did the Grateful Dead comics, but St. Stephen was always one of those songs that was like the, the most mystical of the lyrics and the one that was the most trippy. And I've seen them three times, and twice I really did feel the magic. I, I, I got the the chills because everybody was dancing and taking their shirts off and and the band was going from like you know uh country and western beat to a jazz to like a ballad and i go okay I, this is like this is this is cool you know this is i, I get it you know I from paul plays guitar and i was playing bass at the time and we were playing with a woman named cindy lee berryhill and she wanted to know if we wanted to open for frank the lesbian folk singer and the knitters at the belly up and i'm like are you kidding yeah and but i was so you know i'm still a fan girl at heart when it comes to music musicians so um i i wanted to figure out you know i wanted to figure out a way to talk to you know john doe and exine and frank and kind of you know break the ice and i thought well if i talk to him as a fellow musician i'll just be competition so i brought uh, five copies of Life of the Party. Uh -huh. sort of like, see, I'm not really a musician. I'm really a cartoonist. I'm just playing bass and sitting here. Read this thing. And they were all like, thank you so much. We never have anything to read when we're on the road. This looks like fun. And I go, yeah, it's about musicians. And they go, oh, it's great. And then we start talking. It broke the ice. I think in the 80s and 90s, it was sort of like us indie alternative underground people. It was like us against the world. So we, we, we clung to each other. But now that comics have, have branched out to graphic novels and, and all these other sorts of things, and people are doing digital t comics and printing them, yeah, uh, it's changed. Well, I also think that, that pre the internet, cons were where you went to meet other people who thought like you and had right. interests, and, and there was no other way to connect. So uh, these little conventions are all sort of getting their own little personalities. But Comic Fest, uh, I just thought it was a great, it was just a meeting of the minds and it was just fantastic. And everybody, everybody, if you talk to anybody, went, everybody had a good time. Wow. Now, wasn't that an amazing interview? Mary is just a great teller of stories. And as you can see, she has a million of them. But then with a life like Mary's had, of course. Next time, I'm going to be talking to another really fascinating woman, Trina Robbins. Trina and I are old friends, and many consider her the keeper of the history of women in comics. She's written several books about it, and she has lots to say about it. Do join us then. We'll see you then.